Hello and welcome to In the Light, Growing Your Soul with me, Anna Isabel. And I am joined today by Vanessa May, who has written, I think, a very important book. And it's called Love Untethered, How to Live When a Child Dies. Well, Vanessa, I think there's just so much pain that's within that experience. And reading your book, I, I could certainly feel that pain and anyone would, would, would feel the same reading what you went through. But I think a good place to start would be with the title, um, Love Untethered. So let's begin there. What do you mean by that? Um, well, there's an expression which is um, grief is love with no place to go. And for me, that doesn't feel right for me anyway, because I think your love after somebody has died continues and it does have somewhere to go. And so love untethered is how you think your love is initially. You think, well, it's untethered. Where am I going to direct it to? I've got all this love in my heart for my son. And where does it now go? But um, the fact is the love continues. You continue to love them. And it does have somewhere to go. And, and it is still tethered to not a physical body, unfortunately, but to a soul that still exists, if that's your belief and it is mine. So that's really why I chose the title, if that makes sense. It does, actually. And uh, regular viewers know that I am a, an analytical hypnotherapist. And one of the aspects is exactly dealing with, with helping people who are grieving for the loss of someone they love and it's so true what you've just said you know you've got all this love and it doesn't disappear and so much of the work that I do with my clients who are suffering in this way is to actually help them to see that the love the love isn't going anywhere it's still there it's part of them and I think too that that it's okay to still have it because Definitely. there's so much there's so much you know about moving on and um, the fact that well you have to come to terms with and you have to accept that actually no you don't you don't have to do any of those things because no. That is about, that just emphasizes the, the feeling of, of severing that you've already got from being separated from the physical. But, but we don't have to let go of anything else. No, we absolutely don't. And um, I now work as a holistic grief coach. And um, so those outmoded grief models such as the five stages of grief um, and having to let go move on find closure just doesn't ring true in this day and age and nor should it so it is about continuing your bond with the person that is now living in a different uh, dimension for want of a better expression so I'm, I'm all about that when I'm working with clients that the love continues and, and, you know, death ends a life, not a relationship. I'm still a mother to my son. And I have to say that this doesn't make everything all right. It's still incredibly painful and a daily struggle um, because when you lose your child, it's, it's a primal pain, the bond you have between, you know, a mother and a child. So it's brutal. But if you're going to survive, then you have to navigate your way through somehow. And it's not easy and it doesn't, it's not all, you know, 
a bed of roses. But I do think just whether you have a spiritual belief or not, actually just understanding that your bond continues, that you can honour them in any way you choose. It might be making their favourite meal. It might be lighting candles. It might, you know, might be celebrating their birthday still. All these things um, are really now being shown to be the, mo- the healthiest way to grieve. Um, and that's what I try to do with my clients, really, is to, yeah. And, I, and I've trained with David Kessler, who's the leading grief expert in the States. And, and, and he's fantastic. And he's also lost a child. So it's it's just about finding continuing your connection and continuing your bond so absolutely right it's that that needs to continue and that should not be denied us um because that's just not necessary it's not necessary to have this wall suddenly come down um and i i love what you said about still celebrating the birthday and because these are all things that I work on with clients is finding a way and you use the word honoring absolutely Mm -hmm. that is exactly it honoring the the relationship um, as it exists still within your heart makes me think about all the um the different cultures where ancestors continue to be honored yeah there is yeah. a... so you are a holistic grief coach and we can pretty much deduce what it is that you do um <laughs> well yes so um before harry died i was a nutritional therapist and a well-being coach and then obviously my world was turned upside down and I couldn't work for a long time. I was diagnosed with PTSD. I was very traumatized. So I started writing what turns into Love Untethered as a way of processing my grief. Um, And because I didn't, I didn't find uh, any grief support, conventional grief support. I wish I'd found you by the sounds of it, but, um, but that would look at things from the point of view of the spiritual aspect, but also the physical aspect. I was having these terrible physical symptoms, which as a nutritional therapist, I understood, but I needed someone to normalize and go, yeah, that's quite in shock, in trauma. That's what happens. But most people, when they think of grief, they know it's painful emotionally. They don't understand it's it's the whole body, a whole being experience. It affects mind, body and spirit. Um, And certainly when I was starting to feel I needed to communicate with my son and I went to mediums um, and I was asking him for signs and, and of course, therapists, well, therapists I saw really were not kind of open to this at all. So I thought, wow, there isn't any there. I could not find the support I needed. Um, And although I did read some books by bereaved mothers which were great. I didn't find a British one. And I just thought, honestly, there's there's something missing here. I need I need to read the experience of, and I did find a very good brief parents group, which was helpful. But I just needed, and now I'm getting so much response to Love Untethered from other bereaved mothers saying, it's like you told my story. Thank you for normalizing how I feel. And it, 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 that makes it just completely worthwhile. I mean, the book is for anyone who's experienced a loss or is trying to support someone who is. But obviously I am a bereaved mother and that's how I wrote it. So, so yeah, so writing became my sort of therapy. And then as I was writing it and I knew that I had to go back to work and I just thought, I don't think I can go back to doing what I did before. And I thought, well, maybe I can you know, because the one thing that the grief was giving me was, I mean, I I was reading, I was reading so much and I was reading about the afterlife and, and grief just generally and trying to make sense of what was happening to me one way or another. And I thought, 
if I'm not getting the support I need, then there'll be other people who aren't getting the support they need. And I thought, well, I'm a coach. That's the emotional side. I'm a nutritional therapist. That's the physical side. I'm, I'm understanding more and more about the physical. And I thought, yeah, I, I think I need. To, and, and also sometimes when you've had something totally catastrophic happen to you, you have this uh, need to help other people in your position. It just sort of evolves. And obviously I was doing a job where I was helping people in a different way. And I thought I need to help people who are grieving, who are not understood by society. We live in a very grief averse society. People do not get it. And it, it's, it drives me mad. Um, so I'm doing my little bits to raise awareness of what a traumatic loss is like. Because not all grief is equal. Um, you know, child loss is the far end of the scale. So yeah, uh, that that's why I ended up um, becoming a holistic grief coach and uh, as a way to help people like me because I didn't get that help. When you were talking about the, the physical side of things and, you know, I was reading what was happening to you and... Of course, there is a physical element to this because the hormones that are being released, your body is being flooded with adrenaline. It's being flooded with cortisol and heaven knows what else. You are going to have physical symptoms and, and that is going to be normal under the circumstances. And you're quite right. People, it's, it's very frightening to suddenly have their bodies behaving in this way but you only need to think about situations in which you are extremely nervous what happens at that point the acceleration of the heart um, perhaps yeah. needing to go to the toilet a little bit more often than might be expected um, all of these things because it's that fight flight response that the body is experiencing and so the problem here is that what is designed for a, a quick response exactly, is not going away because yeah. this is not, you know, your son is not going to return. And it's, I think lit, reading what I felt was happening it, it just in the, those early, in that early time was this, having to accept the reality of that mm. and, and your body experiencing grief but fear because yes. there, was, there was just that 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 unreality that feeling of unreality maybe this will all go away but the fear that actually it's not going to go all away so there's all these different feelings that are not rational because feelings are not rational they have a rationale of their own yeah, but in some ways you could argue it is quite rational when something really terrible has happened, then you have to be on alert because you now know something really bad can happen and it might happen again. Exactly. And, and sometimes it does, you know, so uh, your body is on high, the problem remain, it, it is if the, your body remains on high alert and then your nervous system is so dysregulated and that leads to PTSD etc and so it, it it's but people don't necessarily have much it's getting better but there, there's generally not much of an understanding about what grief and grief is the biggest stress you can possibly endure um particularly if there's it's traumatic which is sudden death and out of order death it invariably you know means that it's traumatic yeah and it, and it's it's like i said you know there's a rationale to our feelings. It's not rational in the way that we think of as being rational. But in my experience as a therapist, every feeling, every belief that is presented to me makes complete sense in the context of the situation. Right. The feelings are very rational in their own way. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's a rationale there. And once we can understand what the rationale is, then everything begins to make sense. And, and we can work from there. 
So here you are working as a holistic grief coach. And I guess a good question would be, what would you, what are your first words of counsel for someone who is recently bereaved? My first question is usually, how are you feeling today? Because it's so vast that you almost have to bring them to how do you feel now kind of thing. Um, and in the first sessions, they just want to tell their story and they want to be heard and they want to have their grief validated. And it, so that's, that's what happens. They just want to get it out. They just want someone to go, yeah, you know, that's terrible. And of course, where, I mean, I don't necessarily with everyone share what's happened to me, but they will know that I've, you know, certainly with bereaved mothers, I'll say, yeah, I, I, I've experienced this. And immediately they're like, oh, sigh of relief, you're actually going to guess it. And I want people to feel I get it. And that is because of the society we live in generally. And because even the people who do support you, they, they get a bit of compassion fatigue. and you know you go you get on with your life and, and they their lives move on and they assume yours does and it maybe it hasn't and then you feel you can't talk about it because you think they don't want to know so these are the issues that that i i come up um against with people just usually people just want someone to talk to um and tell their story to you and later on we might look at ways to honor the person they've lost we might look at uh various exercises um looking at things like you know guilt anger all these things that are natural in grief we might look at old wounds because often they get triggered so in a loss suddenly you feel abandoned by the person who's died and then you look back and you think oh yeah i felt abandoned when my father left or whatever it might be or the a relationship breakup or whatever it might be so although it's not therapy as such you're not going to sit for hours talking about your childhood you're going to maybe bring that in if it's relevant to the feelings that have come up for you um in in the moment it's good that you were talking about the need to tell the story and you were talking about people getting compassion fatigue. I think one of the things that my clients talk about finding difficult is that you repeat the story enough times and people stop wanting to hear it again. And, and they're, they're very aware that they feel stuck in this, mm loop because it's like a compulsion to retell the story but it's they're aware that other people have now switched off yeah so what we're saying is actually that's a normal part of the process this and i i think what's happening there in many instances is the need to go over the story, but from every different angle, because it's part of the processing. And yeah. maybe if I had done this, maybe if so-and-so had done that, and, and you kind of need to go through it in, in the greatest detail with a magnifying glass, just to make sure that you're not responsible. Yeah. And it's it's a really normal feeling to think if only I'd done that, I should have done that. Why didn't I do that? It's my fault, I think. Uh, and, and bereaved mothers feel that above anyone else because our job is to keep our child safe. And we failed at that. And um, and that's a really normal reaction. But of course, it isn't our fault. It's no, you know, and in most cases, it is nobody's fault that that person died. 
it's outside our control, but we, you know, it's feeling helpless. And we'd rather blame ourselves than feel that we had no control over it because that's a bit scary. You know, um, that's such a big, big thing because, and I, I encounter this with clients in different contexts. It's not solely in the context of bereavement, but it's, it's it, because part of this is coming to terms that not everything is within our control and we do seem to prefer to torture ourselves into believing <laughs> that something that we could have done than accept the fact that not everything is in our control I think this is a very human thing yeah I agree and we have particularly in you know the modern day we want to fix everything and we want to believe it's fixable um so we should have done that we should have fixed it and then they'd have lived and then there's the whole thing around grief can't be fixed you know you can't fix grief and people around you want to go how can i make it make it better how can i make it go away um and now that is probably a little bit more typical if say you've lost a, an elderly parent if you've lost a child to be fair people are a little bit more understanding that okay that's not going to go away anytime soon but then when you've lost a child and i think this is true of losing a spouse as well you get the whole thing of oh my god this might be catching i better not talk to that person i'm going to cross the road i don't know what to say i don't want to think about it what if i lost my child oh i'm not going to go there so let's just pretend i haven't seen her and that's my experience and other people's experiences who've lost a child or a partner and I think, so, you know, <laughs> whoever you've lost there, there is problematic in some way. People just don't know how to deal with it, but it's very hurtful and, and um, it, it makes you feel very isolated and grief can be very isolated, isolating, you know? And I think, yeah, it, it's, I, the way, what I'm hoping is, you know, even 10 years ago, we didn't really, have the awareness around mental health that we do now we forget that it was quite stigmatized now it's all out there it's all open as it should be so i'm really hoping that that will happen for grief and people will be more open about it they will be more educated about it you know we weren't that educated about mental health even 10 years ago well i'd like that to be the case for grief so that people get it I and mean, that's why I'm hoping my book you know people will have so even if you haven't lost anyone I hope that you know that, that people listening to this will kind of go well this will just be interesting to understand a bit more of the human experience albeit that mine is a bit more extreme but everyone is going to lose someone in their lifetime and loss we're talking about loss in the context of death mm. but we experience loss in many different contexts, the loss of a job, um, the, the loss of a marriage, the, the end of a relationship. Um, so this applies to loss in general. Yeah. Of course, you know, the finality of death makes it so much more exaggerated, enlarged. The, the pain is magnified, but loss in all its different forms is painful. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if you, if you suddenly discover that the marriage that you thought you had is not the marriage that you thought you had, that's a shock right there as well. And so all of these things that we're talking to, talking about apply in different contexts as well. And the more yeah. that we understand the, our reactions and the reactions of others, I think the, the better, because it means that we're able to deal with, it, with each other with greater compassion and empathy and hold each other better. Mm -hmm yeah absolutely yeah it's a human experience and for whatever reason some people 
have more suffering in their life times than other people do so compassion towards everybody um is is vital for for the human experience something that you you said um which was about you know people not wanting to to talk um to you if you you know that that feeling of not knowing what to say not knowing how to connect i think obviously that's also part of touching on their own fears um oh, and, yeah. and and that that sense of, of vulnerability yes definitely it's fear it's it's because we all know life is fragile and we all know we're going to die but most people just don't want to think about it. If they don't think about it, then it might not happen. Even though they know it will, everyone will die in the end. But there's something about the loss of a child that plays into the fear of every parent. Um, and some people just don't handle that very well. So you do lose friends. It's really common for... Um, for your parents to lose friends, they just drop away. But you do find out there are people who do stand by you and they're just earth angels, frankly. They're amazing. And I've got a few of those, but I've also lost a lot of friends. It's really, it's like, these are secondary losses. So secondary losses are things like the loss of friendship, the loss of your, things that you wouldn't perhaps think of, loss of self-esteem is one you you'd start doubting yourself everything's become a feeling you know unsafe uncertain um there are a lot of secondary losses with, with grief you know if if you're um suddenly find yourself to be a widow and you've lost your partner's income household income then suddenly that makes you feel very destabilized you've lost the person just to watch a film with or chat to over you know dinner or whatever these are all secondary losses that um are difficult on top of the actual pain of the person having died and it's it's also the case i think we should see that it is normal that we are going to let's say shed some some people we're going to shed some people because the fact of the matter is that life has changed. So you are not going to be the same person. No, absolutely I'm not. Not the same person I was before my father passed away. I'm not. In many ways, my life has become infinitely richer because of the ways in which I have changed. And, and that was, I would say, I would rate it as a very uncomplicated death, a very uncomplicated bereavement. He was ill for a very long time. And I was able to say everything I wanted to say. I was able to support him in his passing. I was, you know, there was a, a, a there was, it was an uncomplicated relationship. So mm. this is as good a bereavement as you are going to have. Yeah. And yet, I'm not the same person I was. And that's the thing that we need to also understand, because sometimes clients experience distress over the fact that they're not the same. But of course, of course, we're not the same. Yeah, no, because you, you've been through one way or another, you've been through a, a, a very transformative experience and if you've if there's been trauma involved then you've literally had your life shattered and sometimes when we're shattered and our our heart is broken then you know there's that expression the the um, the wound is where the light enters so whilst i am in no way speaking and I'm speaking for myself here as well suggesting that oh I've had this terrible experience and now look what I've gained because I would obviously that's not the case but if it's happened and your heart is broken open 
then you do and you your way forward is to find a life with more meaning and purpose not everybody does however but that's one of the ways that I work with my clients and also for myself I'm trying to find uh me you know my spiritual uh belief is so important to me that my son's soul lives on and um that I am connected to him still because they you know they do say I think it's Alan Wolfett who says it's the spiritual aspect of grief that allows us to go on after something like a loss of a child or any loss but particularly the you know something tra- an out of uh, order death in particular and so yeah that's that's a massive part of of so I, I would say I, I'm massively changed uh, in good ways and, le- you know, I'm very damaged by what's happened to me. And that's why I have to sort of temper this with realism. So, yes, I'm a lot wiser. I understand a lot more about life, death, the afterlife, uh, all of that. I, I've got a whole new area of expertise, which is grief and trauma. But... I'd rather I didn't, to be honest. <laughs> well, the reality is you're wounded and and there's this this wound that's deep inside you. And that's never going to go away. No, never. But what you have done and what you're working with your clients to do and what I work with my clients to do and what I have done myself is allowed that wound to inform who I am in the most positive way possible for myself and for others for yourself and for others yeah. and i think that's and and this comes back to uh something you said earlier about uh, our culture being a culture of fixing everything and you know there are things you cannot fix and there are things that we ought not attempt to fix either mm-hmm. you know death is a part of life it is not in our gift to fix it um it happens. Sometimes it's expected. Sometimes it's unexpected. It's always brutal in different ways. That because it must be because it means a physical severing with somebody that we we love dearly. So of course it's always going to be brutal in that way. Mm-hmm. But yeah. we cannot fix it. We cannot stop it, and it's not within our power to do so. And maybe it shouldn't be in our power to do so. It's the way it is, but what we can have, what we have is the capacity to heal. And, and, and that healing, what that healing does not look like is the wound being erased away. What the healing yes. looks like is being able to do more than function with with that wound or despite that wound what healings look like looks like is being able to accept the wound and hold ourselves with love and compassion and then take that out into the world Mm -hmm. yeah yes i would agree Uh, there's uh, an author called tom zuber who lost two children and his wife and and he says that healing is my way of being in the world in other words it's not a destination he's not one day going to be like yep I'm over my wife I'm over my kids I'm all right let's carry on he's going this is forever but that's my way of being in the world and I think that is quite particularly for the really you know traumatic losses that is the way to to kind of get your head around it because otherwise you're just going to go I'm just my life is over it's so terrible rather than going yeah it is but you are healing you are in the process of healing um healed is perhaps the destination you may or well, perhaps none of us in any respect are ever fully healed because um you know uh, uh, and, and also i feel this experience is about soul growth and it does give an opportunity for soul growth and wisdom and understanding that you might rather not have but um you know it, it happens if if you allow it to because some people do just they do know bereaved mothers who just 
are stuck in their grief and I don't blame them but it's it's horrible to see that the, the pain they remain in and it doesn't shift so I'm all about shifting it realistically uh, you know and helping others to do so but um yeah you know it's it's something's just occurred to me and it's reminded me that when I was doing my training in hypnotherapy and we came to the part of the training that was to do with medical um, hypnotherapy. So what we were learning to do was helping people to reduce the amount of physical pain they feel. So it's about pain management. So a, for instance, um, when I'm working with women who are pregnant and I'm helping them prepare for labor, for them to be able to reduce the amount of pain that they're going to feel, um, or what, if it's chronic pain that someone's suffering from. I, I was very puzzled at the time by this, um, but we were trained to reduce the pain, to, to help the person reduce the pain to management levels. So let's say they normally felt um, pain as an eight out of 10 to bring it down to a two out of 10. And we were all very puzzled because clearly what we wanted to do as novice, novices and students was reduce it down to the zero. zero. <laughs> and it really surprised us that that was not the aim. The, the aim mm -hmm. was not zero. And our teacher explained, and he was absolutely right. He, he explained that if we, if we set that as an aim, the person would reject it outright. And we would never achieve the two because when they are in that pain, it is hard for them to conceive that they could ever be out of pain. Mm. But if we could help them to, re to accept the possibility that we can minimize the pain so that they could feel more comfortable and function then the subconscious would accept that as a possibility and we could well achieve a zero. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I, I think that this is so true for us at an emotional level as well. And I think, you know, we go through that time too where we actually don't want to let go of the pain because if we, if we, there's that fear that if we let go of the pain, we're going to somehow be disloyal or forget the person or that it means the end to the relationship. Well, we yes, I've never really got that. I know that that's how, I, for me, it's, that's never been the case. Or people will say, oh, well, I can't have fun. I can't laugh again because, you know, and I'm, I always think, well, my son would want me to laugh. He'd want me to be happy. He'd want me to grab the moments that I can. He'd also understand why I have, times when I'm really struggling and in pain he'd get get it all but yeah I know that's quite common I personally have, have never never felt that you know that's be. good because it's so common I've seen this so often where there's that fear that if I if I'm just going to if I'm not sad it means that I've lost the connection but you see, that's when I think that's the continuing bond, uh, isn't it, of continuing the um, the connection in its new form. You have to let go of the physical because the physical body has gone. And if you've seen their body, you've seen that they are gone from that shell. There is no doubt about it. And, you know, uh, you you have to find them in another way. And, and I feel very strongly about that. And it's amazing how many of, of my clients really do want to explore the spiritual because they haven't kind of had anyone they feel will get it or, you know, think they're being silly or delusional. But it is, that is one way of continuing that connection. And then you can let, you have to just go, you have to accept that the physical is something you will never have. I'd give anything to have a hug from my son because he gave the best hugs. But I have to accept that and yes. find a different way of connection with him. So we're talking a lot about individuals, and but obviously this is a family 
issue and different members of a family may grieve differently. Absolutely. How do you go about working when you've got a client? Are you working with the family as a whole as well? Or how not, are you? It? Not usually. Uh, funnily enough, I do have some training in family dynamics, but that's that was I used to use that in a context of um, say the mother of a child who had chronic fatigue or an eating disorder or whatever. Um, but but no, what I but I guess I bring that training in when I'm listening to someone who says, but my husband's doing it differently. My uh, my son won't open up about it. So I always normalize all of this and I always say everybody does grief differently. You're going to be on different pages. Of course, that's really hard because you feel very isolated within a family then. Um, and and I think that the, there's there was a sort of a common belief that, oh, if you've lost a child, you're more likely to divorce. But actually, that isn't necessarily true, particularly if you accept that your partner is got and met the difference between men and women and grief, they're going to do it differently. Um, and so, of course, the other problem you might have, not uh, bereaved, not losing a child, but say you're a couple and your wife has lost their father, for example, and you're very empathetic to begin with. And then you're kind of like, oh, come on, can we get back to normal? And the wife goes, no, I'm still really missing them and I can't. And now, and so that causes conflict. So it's it is complex. Grief is complex, um, you know, and has a big effect on relationships one way or another. Yeah, it's it's tough all round. It is. And I, I like you, I tend to, when we're talking about um, other members of the family, it's so helpful for, 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 for the individual to have someone who says, well, you know, that's that's quite normal too and you know perhaps we can look at it this way or we can look at it that way so that they've got, got a better grasp a better understanding of why the reaction they're getting is the reaction they're getting and that yeah. too is very helpful life has changed for everybody and mm. um, and some some people within the family may be more accepting of that than others. Others may just want to pretend it's not happened for a while as yeah. well. Very, yeah. very yeah, some some people will throw themselves into work or you know, and other people will hide themselves away and, and you know it, every, some people will seek help, others won't. I think part of of what my job is now and, and what I try to do through Love Untethered and and just generally is to normalize it all whatever you feel is okay there's no right or wrong way to grieve and within a family you will all do it differently and sometimes you'll be on different pages and then you might walk together for a while and it's just a question of respecting it res respecting each other um, a good way to think about it is that you've received the same wound but you're experiencing the pain differently or the pain is affecting you differently. It's the same pain, but it's having a different effect on everyone. And, and I also, think- Yeah, what comes into play, I think, is the relationship you had with that widow. Were you close to them? Was there conflict? There's all of that. Indeed, it's a, it's a very big one, that. Um, so, if people want to um, get in touch with you, um, do you have a website, Vanessa? I do. I have two websites, um, but I'll, I'll give you my author website. And then from there, you can go across to the Holistic Grief Coaching if you want to. Um, so my author website, because I've got two books, but Love Untethered, obviously, is what we're talking about today. Um, it, and it's uh, Vanessa May uk. So quite simple, Vanessa May uk. And I um, post a lot about grief on Instagram, which is at may.wellbeing. Um, and if you read my book, I really love to hear from people. It, it helps me, it helps my healing to hear if my book's touched someone. 
So I've been so appreciating all the messages I've had so far. And as I say, it helps me to hear that it's helping others. So if you read Love on Tether, please let me know. Well, your book certainly touched me and I am very grateful for your time here today. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for your, your wonderful book and everything that you are doing. And just uh, to remind everyone, the book that we are talking about is Love Untethered, How to Live When a Child Dies. And Vanessa, thank you so much once again. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Now, next time, we're going to be looking at the soul path of our animal companions. And um, before then, if you'd like to just make sure that you, if, if you'd like to learn more about my own work, you can also look at my website, the link to that and to Vanessa's book and her website will all be in the description box. Until next time, goodbye.